Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my review of the 1995 political drama, Nixon. Now, Nixon is a film that, honestly, I had some high expectations for, considering who was involved with the director, Oliver Stone, and another really great cast. And I'm not going to sit here and say that I thought this film was a total failure, but it definitely wasn't a total success either, and honestly, I would say it was pretty mediocre. And considering everyone that was available for this film, and considering how good this film appeared to be on paper, that's pretty disappointing. And I'm not the only one, because it seemed like audiences and critics, when this was released in 1995, had similar feelings. Uh, I know Nixon's daughters completely disowned this movie when it came out because of its portrayal of Nixon. They felt it was too one-sided, and I honestly do agree with that. I think that's one of the film's uh, problems is that Nixon is so villainous. He's so one-sided in terms of his portrayal. He comes across as a cartoon villain half the time, and I, I think that was a mistake. Also... It's one of those movies that, unlike JFK, really does feel long. JFK was over three hours, the director's cut, but it actually went by at a good pace. Nixon moves at a very sluggish pace, and I think a big part of it is because the story of Nixon, his rise to power and then his ultimate fall, is nowhere near as compelling and interesting as the conspiracy behind the assassination of John F. Kennedy. You know what happened with Watergate. Watergate itself and everything that happened with that is honestly kind of boring. Uh, and the best version of that scandal was already released at this point in All the President's Men. So there really wasn't a, a, a much there in terms of the Watergate scandal. So what you're left with is Nixon and his backstory and his life. And there are some moments where it does grab you, uh, mainly because of Anthony Hopkins and his really fantastic performance. He does the best he can to try to make this into something special. And there are some times and some moments where he manages to do that despite how bad of a hand he was dealt in terms of this screenplay and there's some moments of the visuals where it does uh shine that's where the director oliver stone comes into play i would say his direction in jfk was better i would say his direction in a lot of other films that he's that he has done in his career is better than nixon but i'm not going to say that his direction was bad it was a solid job uh, there were the a lot of shots in this that were ambitious and well done in terms of different angles. Like we'll, we'll have a lot of shots that are that are off kilter uh, to create a certain mood. He also managed to uh, insert a lot of variety in terms of zooms and and pans and he shot sequences from looking down at Nixon or looking up or looking at him from the side. And there was some really interesting uh, green screening that he did where Nixon would be standing in one place and there would be a bunch of like war footage from Vietnam and bombs being dropped in the background. Uh, so the film had some really nice looking visuals at times. There was a nightmarish sequence while Nixon was in the hospital with phlebitis that used a lot of really nice lighting in terms of red lighting and other things to create a very otherworldly and surreal uh, atmosphere. So the film does have a lot going for it when it comes to Stone's direction. I think he's done a better job in other films, like I mentioned, but it's still one of the more consistent things when it comes to this movie. Although there were some times where he was a little too ambitious, and I feel that he tried a little bit too much to try to copy the same style from JFK with the black and white footage cut with color and the different uh, uh, almost documentary style 
uh, filming techniques and it worked in JFK but here it doesn't really work in the same fashion and I honestly comes across like a pale imitator most of the time the script though is really where this film falters the most by Stephen J. Revelle, Christopher Wilkinson and Oliver Stone and it falters in a, a fair number of ways for one the portrayal of Nixon is not very good there's not a lot of dynamic to this guy. He comes across as more of a villainous crook, this son of a bitch, this uh, mean, mugging, megalomaniac. You rarely see moments where this man comes across as a likable person. So when it comes to his fall that really affects the pacing of the film because when you have a film that's as long as Nixon you want to be along for the ride in terms of seeing how this man ultimately becomes so corrupted and becomes so evil and becomes such a lying uh, crook but that's not what happens here he, he has these moments where he comes across like a untrustworthy son of a bitch very early in the movie so you never really have a moment where you honestly sympathize with him that much because you're like well you fucking deserved it you megalomaniac you fucking asshole like you you dickhead and i i do feel that that's a problem with the film and i'm not the only one that there, there were a lot of people who knew nixon that were like what like, it was more than just this. Yeah, he had his moments where he was really uh, uh, leaning hard into villain territory. But he also had moments where he was uh, a good speaker. He was uh, a genuinely nice man. There's a scene that tries to show that between him and his daughter. But it's handled so pissed poorly that you don't buy it. His daughter's talking about how, oh, I know the real you, and you're you're the nicest person I've ever met, and you don't even see any of that with his daughter. You barely even saw scenes with Nixon and his daughter to begin with, and this scene shows her hugging her father, and it's shot in a way that makes it look like he's dead inside, because he's hugging her, and it focuses on his face, and he's just glassy-eyed, like there's nothing there, and... That might have been really powerful if you saw other scenes where he was being nice and he was being charismatic. But any sequence with Nixon in this where he's trying to be charismatic just comes across as fake. Like his smile. And it's just not really a good way to showcase a real life person, let alone a main character in a film. Then you have all these other characters, and a lot of them don't really have very compelling narratives, or the they come and they go. Uh, they are nowhere near as compelling or interesting to watch as anyone in JFK, for instance. Even the smaller characters in that film were relatively memorable and strong a lot of the supporting characters in this i don't even remember their fucking names despite who's playing them and then you have the whole stuff with nixon and his, and his rise to power and there are some moments where it's a little interesting especially when it comes to the backstory of his childhood and that's where it gets a sliver of sympathy is you do ultimately feel for him because he lost both his brothers at a pretty young age of t by uh, tuberculosis and he's always felt this pressure due to their death to uh, or to be this hero to do the right thing to be the be the light uh and 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 to just be this this really hard to come by person to he felt the weight of that throughout his life and that led to him doing a lot of rash things it led to him 
doing a lot of things that ultimately led to his destruction. And I think there is a certain poignant bit to that uh, actual real-life storytelling. And there are some moments where, yeah, it, it does make you feel for him. But even those scenes are a little bit overwrought or not handled very well. I don't care if his mother spoke like this in real life. It's distracting and it's it's silly to hear Mary Steenburgen speak like she's from Amish country saying thee and thou uh, and no one else in his family is speaking like that at all. So I don't understand why the mother of Nixon was speaking like that, even if that was the case, even that even if that was how she spoke change it Ch you've changed so many other things in this script you've taken all these other uh creative liberties to the point where the film opens up with a disclaimer pretty much saying that we made most of this up and you're still gonna leave her his mom saying thee and thou like it's shakespeare or some shit it's i don't understand that at all and the Watergate stuff, it's not as exciting as you think it might be. Because in real life, it wasn't that exciting. So you have that. And that doesn't really happen until like the last 40 minutes of the movie. And I would say the fall of Nixon is the most captivating thing about this movie. And they don't really spend as much time on that as you think. Really only like 30 minutes. For a film that's like over three hours, if you're talking about the director's cut. So I feel that that was a mistake too. Because the whole stuff with his extension of the Vietnam War and him bombing all these different places and dra dragging things out. And his conflict with the young people uh, who want the war to end and him meeting with these leaders of Russia and China. It's just not really as compelling or captivating as I think the, the writers uh, felt that it, that it was most of the time, the most gripping scenes in the film honestly are little scenes with Nixon and his wife where you get to see their relationship as it initially blossoms. And then as it withers and then as it remains strong, despite all that these two have been through. And uh, I, I think that's really the core of the, the film's heart, really, is, is the relationship between those two. And uh, honestly, it could have focused in, on it even more, or at least more on the relationship between Nixon and his family, because you barely see any scenes with him and his daughters. And... There's a lot of moments in this film that definitely do uh, entertain when it comes to Anthony Hopkins being able to sink his teeth into a lot of these meaty lines of dialogue where Nixon is calling people cocksuckers and being a foul-mouthed tyrant. And those scenes work, but there are some moments where they come across as a little ridiculous but they're still entertaining and they still work well enough because Hopkins is such a, a master of his craft. But yeah, I mean, probably a lot of you are like, well, that doesn't sound like much. And yeah, it isn't really a whole lot. That, that There's really no reason for this to be over three hours. I'm sorry. I like the fact that they showcase the, uh, the disastrous... Uh, debate that Nixon had with JFK where he looked haggard and they talk about his perspective on that and, and the party's perspective on that. I don't like how they try to shoehorn JFK into this by talking about the Bay of Pigs and talking about these shady people that might have killed JFK. It's like, do we really need to do that again? I understand Oliver Stone, you're really passionate about that, but that just reminds people of a better movie that you directed. You didn't need to do that. That does not help your film. It honestly hurts your film. It doesn't help it at all. And I, I like 
some other uh, moments here and there. Uh, specifically, the the moment when Nixon retires initially in 1962, and then he decides to run again after JFK's assassination. Uh, because I felt that was an interesting part of Nixon's trajectory and a, and a part of his life. Because if you think about it, it was a very unlikely story, very unlikely comeback story for Nixon to come back at his age, especially at this time, and win the presidency after five years, after 1962. I mean, that was that was something that was really uh, unheard of back then. And it's it's pretty rare nowadays, too, for someone to essentially quit and be disgraced and be humiliated and come back and win it all. And I think they could have focused on that even more to make Nixon an even more likable guy, show him change his personality more because there's moments in interviews where I've seen like making ofs of this movie where they're trying to say, well, yeah, this is a moment when he changes his image and I'm like that never really happened I I'm sorry I didn't really buy that he changed his image because I said he, that's when he became more cornball like JFK and I'm like I didn't really see that so you should have made that a little more evident and if he did that then then you could have the the underdog story they really should have focused more on the underdog story a lot more than they did in terms of him rising to the top of the mountain then it would make his fall from grace even more compelling because you're like, man, like you had everything and it would make lines of dialogue where like the Russian, uh, um, I don't, prime minister is probably not the right word, but the, the, the leader of Russia, he says, oh, he had the world in his hands and yeah, it would make all that so much more powerful, leave more of an impact than it does if it just had more of a dynamic with Nixon it just came across as too one-sided and I'm not the only one a lot of critics at the time and to this day say the exact same thing about the writing in this when it comes to Nixon and I think they should have nixed that <laughs> no pun intended they really should have nixed that approach but one thing that I don't feel that they should have nixed is the casting this has a really excellent cast i mean anthony hopkins there were some moments in this film where he just absolutely kills it and i would say that he deserved the oscar nomination and i would say that this is one of his better acting performances he in a lot of ways is a big reason why i kept watching the movie because i just wanted to watch hopkins work i wanted to see him work his magic and show his mastery of of the craft and i think he did a great job capturing nixon's mannerisms and his attitude he doesn't necessarily look like nixon uh, i would say he was a bad casting choice in that regard because he looks nothing like nixon at all but he embodied nixon's spirit really well but there were other things where he didn't really uh, embody Nixon on the same level, though. Whether it's just appearance or just his inflection or his uh, voice. There are some moments where he nails it, but then there's other moments where you're like, that just sounds like Anthony Hopkins doing a bad Nixon impression. Like, you're just like... You can even hear his accent coming through. So it's like one of those things you're like, yeah, Hopkins did a really good job. He did the best he possibly could, considering that this is a very difficult difficult role, very hard thing to pull off. And he pretty much managed to do it, despite the fact that there are a lot of distractions, a lot of moments where you're like, wait a minute, like, I can hear your accent, Anthony, or you look nothing like Nixon. Except when he smiles and he does the peace sign. Like, he really did nail that. But there are moments where you can tell that Oliver Stone desperately wanted someone like uh, Jack Nicholson. You can tell that he wanted Jack. And you can see it. You're like, 
you're seeing scenes here and you could almost see a glimmer of Jack Nicholson. And then you're just imagining Jack Nicholson in this role. And you're like, wow, Jack Nicholson would have been amazing. <laughs> like Jack Nicholson would have fit this role so perfectly. You saw a, a little bit of that in Mars Attacks when he plays the president. But imagine that in a serious role. Imagine Jack Nicholson as Richard Nixon. Like, it's a match made in heaven. Like, you would just, oh, I am not a crook. Like, you could totally see, you know, I am not a crook. Like, you could totally see Jack Nicholson just playing that role to perfection. Joan Allen, she is a marvel here as Pat Nixon, the uh, right hand of Richard Nixon in the film. She had some really great chemistry with Anthony Hopkins. You really bought that those two were in love with one another. You bought that they had been through a, a lot. You bought that they had been through a ton of different struggles and tribulations throughout their life with one another. Uh, Annabeth Gish, she's barely even in it as Julie Nixon has a good scene that one scene that she shares with Anthony Hopkins, but it's one sequence, maybe two. Mary Shelton has even less. I don't even remember her having any lines of dialogue. She just gets married in one scene and is all dressed up and looking pretty. And that's really about it. James Woods plays HR Hadelman, uh, an another uh, Haldeman. My bad. Another just great performance by James Woods, a Samarmi uh, advisor for Nixon. Uh, J.T. Walsh, uh, he plays John El Elrickman, another advisor for Nixon. A great casting with these two. Like They are like the epitome of shady characters. Like When you're thinking about casting shady people in a film, those two are like near the top of the list. Paul Servino... Almost completely unrecognizable as Henry Kissinger. He nailed the guy's eccentric voice and his his mannerisms and everything. I would say it's one of his best performances because you really couldn't tell that it was him underneath all that makeup and without with that voice. And he made it come across as very genuine and, and not like a joke, which other people have done with Kissinger. Uh, Powers Booth... It's nice to see him. He played the U.S. Army general who served under Henry Kissinger. And he was also another advisor uh, uh, for uh, Nixon. And he was the chief of staff for Nixon during the Watergate scandal. Uh, E.G. Marshall, uh, you might recognize him from Creepshow and a few other things. He played uh, a John and Mitchell, Nixon's longtime friend and attorney general. He was the first to be set up to take the fall for Watergate. Uh, there, there's a scene near the end where he's interviewed, where you can see a bit of that Upton Pratt come out, and that that was fun to see. Uh, David Paymer plays a White House press secretary uh, who gets pushed around by Nixon. Good casting choice. He always plays those roles really well. Uh, David Hyde Pierce plays John Dean who is a White House councilman, who was the first to testify in front of Congress. Uh, it wasn't a particularly juicy role, but he did a good job with uh, what he was given. Kevin Dunn plays another uh, council member, who is the director of public liaison, another close advisor to Nixon. Uh, Saul Rubinek plays uh, Huber Herbert J. Klein, the press secretary. There's a few other people. Uh, James Karen plays uh, the Secretary of State who tries to get Nixon not to bomb Cambodia. Uh, there are some other members of Nixon's family from the flashbacks. Mary Steenburgen as his mother, Hannah. Uh, speaking of his mother, this is another aspect of the script I did not get. Uh, there, there's a scene near the end where Nixon is deteriorating and the reality of his reign coming to an end is, is starting to come to him. And he's hallucinating his dead mom's ghost. And it's just ridiculous and dumb and daft and inane and just not handled very well. And honestly, in kind of poor taste. Um... 
so yeah, you have Mary Steenburgen. You know, it's not really one of her best performances. It's a good casting. And there are some moments where the lines that she is given, she really does excel with them. But there's a lot of moments where she just doesn't really seem like she's given her best effort. Especially when she's playing the elderly uh, Hannah in a retirement home, like for her last interview. Uh, that was a pretty phoned-in performance from Mary Steenburgen. You didn't buy at all that this is a woman who had all these years on her life. You know, that kind of thing where you have somebody who's in makeup and they're supposed to be old and they don't really sound that way. So she definitely could have put a little more effort into it in that regard. And I'm not going to blame her for the these and the thous, but, you know, it's just one of those things where it, I don't think anyone really could have pulled that off. Tony Goldwyn... Uh, he played, uh, Harold Nixon, Richard's, uh, older brother who dies of TV. Tom Bauer played, uh, his father, very stern, overbearing, rough father that he admired. Uh, Sean Stone played his younger brother. Um, uh, Corey Carrier played, uh, the young Richard Nixon. Uh, David, uh, Barry Gray played, uh, the teenager, the teenage college age Richard Nixon. And everyone in, in in the family and the flashbacks, they, they really held their own well enough. I would say Tony Goldwyn is the one that stood out the most for me. I've always felt he was a terrific actor, and it was nice to see him again. Uh, Ed Harris played uh, one of the White House plumbers. He played uh, E. Howard Hunt, the CIA operative who was attached to the Bay of Pigs. And he's the one that blackmails the administration and wants all the money. John Deal played uh, G. Gordon Liddy. Robert Beltran played uh, Frank Sturgis. And you have a few other actors and actresses. Bob Hoskins plays J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, it's a, a really juicy role. And I really loved every scene he was in. Uh, he was so good, I wish he was in it more. Uh, Brian Bedford plays Clyde Tolson, Hoover's partner. Uh, life partner and de the deputy FBI director Madeline Kahn she plays uh, John Mitchell's wife she's only in it for a few scenes but man does she make the most out of it she's gregarious she's uh, a loud mouth and you really do enjoy every scene that she's in she added a, a genuine spark to the film Edward Herman he plays Nelson Rockefeller Nice little role for him. He always played those rich hoity toity guys very well. Dan Hedaya plays uh, uh, Trina, Trini uh, Cardozo, who's based on B.B. Rebozo, who's another advisor for Nixon. Uh, Bridget Wilson plays this. I, I, I don't think it's a stripper, but uh, she's an escort of some sort, or, or I have a showgirl who has a, a, a brief scene with Nixon. Uh, Sam Watterson, he plays Richard Helms in scenes that are only in the director's cut, the director of the CIA, and it almost it's almost like he's trying to out-mustache twirl Anthony Hopkins with this character. Richard Helms is still alive when this film was made, and he hated the betrayal of, him, of himself in this film, and you can see why. I mean, there's even a scene later on... I, I kid you not, where Sam Watterson, he looks up at Nixon and he's got like black, beady, dark devil eyes. <laughs> and you're like, what the fuck? No wonder uh, uh, Richard Helms hated this betrayal. Basically betrayed him as the fucking devil. Uh, Tony Lo Bianco, uh, he's been in a few things in the past. Uh, he plays uh, Johnny Roselli, a gangster that Nixon knew in Cuba. Uh, and then only other uh, cast member I want to mention is Larry Hagman, who plays Jack Jones. He's uh, not really a real person. He's just a composite character of all these other billionaires and all these big business guys who are controlling things behind the scenes. He was fantastic. Uh, really enjoyed every scene that he was in. And that's the cast. Like I was saying, it's a great cast. It really is. 
but it doesn't mean that it makes for a great film. Features some decent cinematography by Robert Richardson. There were some moments where it looked a little samey. Some of the cinematography just kind of had the same flat look to it. There were some other scenes, though, where, where the cinematography really did uh, shine and, and it really did um, stand out in a good way. That's why I find it to be decent, a decent job. Nothing that's going to make your jaw drop, but some some moments are definitely quite uh, impressive and definitely have a nice size and scope to them. Some of the scenes of the White House, for instance, at night, uh, some of the more moments of foreboding nature in terms of what's to come uh, definitely do uh, leave a, an impression. The editing by Hank Corwin and Brian Burdan, it's fine as well. There are some moments, though, which are li- where it's a little clunky. And you can tell this is another instance where Oliver Stone is try- he's trying so hard to recapture the same magic of JFK. And as a result, there are scenes in this that just come across as very choppy, where it came across as very fluid in that film. The style here doesn't really have the same effectiveness. So there are moments where you're just kind of confused. One scene in particular has Nixon speaking to these protesters uh, at the Capitol in front of the statue of Abraham Lincoln. And so he's speaking to these protesters and there are scenes that are intercut throughout this conversation that shows him just standing and staring up at the Lincoln Memorial. And it's kind of insinuating that they're not even there. So it's all in his head and he's just crazy at this point. He's so mad with power that he's hallucinating this conversation with these protesters. <laughs> and I don't think that was the intent. And that's why the editing is very eh, and just there for me, because there are moments where it's top notch. It really is terrific. The way that it cuts from war footage to Nixon's speeches or so on. But then there's other moments where it's like, what the hell is going on? And and that's that's a problem, for sure. I should not be thinking that Nixon is completely off the deep end when he's supposed to have a serious scene where he's talking with these protesters. And that's when he realizes that the government is, is, is out of control. He, he It's a wild animal. And uh, he can't tame it. The score is by John Williams. He's another holdover from JFK. And there are some moments of brilliance, but for the most part, it's just another just so, so serviceable affair. Just like so many things about this film, it's just mediocre. It's not really a score I would listen to that much or one that I would say it it has a lot of notes that are really going to stick with you. In fact, there are a lot of other scores that he's done previously that have notes that are very similar to what's in this. And they those scores were better. So it kind of felt like he was kind of going through the motions too with this score. Uh, and it's a film that definitely does drag because you don't really get that invested in the story. You don't really care about Richard Nixon to uh, a certain degree, especially near the end. You're just like, just get through the Watergate thing. Just have him sign the paper where he is uh, resigning the presidency so this slog can end. Because, like I said, there's not a lot of moments where you really see this man as somebody that's inspiring or somebody who has a lot of dynamic to him, a lot of layers. And as, as a result... So much of the film just becomes stale and just becomes boring and dull, despite everyone's best efforts. And the theatrical version was 192 minutes. The director's cut is 212, and that is really a hard uh, sit. It took me a couple days to finish it because I was just nodding off. And that's not a good thing at all. But despite the fact that I was nodding off a few times, despite the fact that I have a fair amount of issues with this movie, I don't think it's a bad film. I I don't think it's a movie that 
was completely worthless. I don't think it's a film that was a total failure. Like I said, there were things about it that I really liked. Things about it that really did exceed uh, my expectations or excelled in general. But I can see why this is a bomb. Uh, it, it cost uh, 40, 40 million, 44 million and only made 26 million worldwide. So it was a pretty significant bomb for Synergy. It was one of the final nails in that studio's coffin. And it also put another nail in the coffin of Hollywood Pictures because it was a hyped up film. It was Oliver Stone's follow up to JFK. And it, it just had all the ultimate impact of, uh, of, a, of, of a balloon that had the air slowly let out of it in front of uh, a massive audience. And by slowly, I mean like there's just a little pinprick and then it just slowly lost air and deflated. And then by the end of it, it's just this empty uh, piece of plastic, this empty campaign balloon. It might as well have been a Nixon campaign balloon that just slowly lost air throughout the entire running time. But anyway, uh, I don't know what else to say about Nixon except thanks for watching my review. And as always, I'll see you later. See ya.